So thank you, Beth. Thank you, Pamela, uh, for facilitating the event. Thank, thank you to the Love Library, Dean Walter, Center of Comic Studies, for hosting this wonderful celebration, a vibrant interdisciplinary fusion of comic arts and documentary theater. Team, it's fantastic production. Congratulations. Thank you. And a, grat grat a gratitude for sharing it with us. Um, you're sharing this learning space primarily with emerging playwrights. We also had um, uh, directors and visual artists, historians, developers, uh, their fa faculty, fellow fans had seen the screening. Um, and the Innocence of Seduction is Mark Pratt's second installment to his Four Color Trilogy, a series about the comic book publishing industry. In the first installment, The Mark of Cain, Mark and, and City Lit Theater unmasked the creative origin of the beloved pop culture icon, the Batman. Mark, with your second installment, you focus on the 1950s congressional investigation into supposed link between comic books and juvenile delinquency. You present powerful, vibrant, conflicting identities of three important luminaries in the history of the comic books. William Gaines, founder of the core comic and son of MC Gaines, considered the father of the American comic book. Two phenomenal artists, Matt Baker, a, a black closeted gay artist for romance comics. Janice Ballou, breaking the glass ceiling for women artists in the comic book industry, sadly getting into the industry at the worst time. So show hands, curious. Before you saw this production, how many of you were familiar with the name of William Gaines? So just so you know, we have our historians, <laughs> our librarians, yes, uh, and one. So just curiosity. How many are familiar with Mad Magazine? <laughs> yeah, so we get we get the hands. The artist Matt Baker, the artist Janice Ballou, awareness of the congressional delinquency hearings and the investigation and the influence of comics. So we have a good majority. They're aware of that. Um, so let me start, uh, start this discussion. We're going to also open up to a Q&A um, for our discussion, as we did last year. So Mark, you're going to be familiar with this. Let's create, we're creating um, the origin story of the innocence of seduction as a comic book. And so I'm going to allow you to introduce uh, yourselves, each one of you, but I'm going to give you a full page, a splash page. It's your page. And I want you to describe what we're seeing in that origin page. And you're essentially going to describe your origin, uh, your origin story in theater. And so what would be the image that we're seeing? What would be the action you're doing? Uh, what text might be provided in that panel? And then one additional thing I'd like you to add is something visual, an object perhaps that evokes mystery about you and draws us in to know more about you. Who would like to go first? <laughs> and also, you can just tell us also your character that you played in the, in the, in, uh, it performed in the, in, in, in the production. So, Sean, go ahead and you can start. So again, uh, you know, kindergarten play, uh, The Farmer in the Dell, and uh, that was when I realized that I wanted to be in it more uh, than the little small part that I had. So uh, school theater. After college, I moved to Chicago to uh, take classes at Second City Theater. Um, and uh, from there have been, you know, acting uh, ever since. Uh, and when Mark talked about this play, I, I really was connected to it. I'd been a lifelong fan of Mad Magazine. And uh, after about seven hours of auditioning, I convinced Mark uh, <laughs> that I was right to play Bill Gates. So uh, it was a fabulous uh, uh, experience for me. Um, and I, I just really love this show. Great, thank you. Mark, you wanna come back to you? Sure, uh, can you hear me all right now? I can, mm -hmm. thank you. Great. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, I was uh, always a uh, class clown type of kid. Um, I mean, my my serious interest in theater really started when I was uh, I visited Chicago in the mid 90s 
and I saw a production of American Buffalo at the Remains Theater uh, that was uh, directed by Mike Nussbaum. Uh, may he rest in peace. And uh, I absolutely fell in love with that kind of visceral theatrical experience. Um, so that's my theater uh, uh, origin. Um, the uh, the show itself, uh, really, this this particular play was sort of the genesis of the whole thing. Uh, way, way back 10, 12 years ago, uh, I read The Ten Cent Plague by David Haju, and mm -hmm. uh, that really opened my eyes to a lot of the things that were going on. I knew about, I knew about the Senate hearings, I knew about the juvenile delinquency scare, but um, that book just had so many great stories and so many things that I could expand on and research more about. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, you know, and I'm very open about this. It was through that book that I first learned about Matt Baker and Janice Ballou, um, and uh, then just dug in more and more as much as I could into who those people were and went beyond even what David Aju wrote in that book. Uh, but then when I so when I had the I had the idea for the Bob the Bob Kane Bill Finger play and then this one and then I was like, well, it's two. I might as well write a third one. <laughs> um, very cool. So that's yeah. That's right. We'll we'll come back to that. I'm glad you mentioned that book. Uh, um, it's a, it, interesting references in there. Go ahead, Brian or Megan. I can go. Okay. Um. I kind of got my start uh, because I was very shy and scared and I wanted to do something that kind of forced me to not be that way. So I tried to join as many things that I could to break me out of that shell. So I guess if I had a splash page for my origin story, it would just be me like sweating and stressed and crying a little bit. Um, but it started to get easier and easier as I went and I was a tree in the Wizard of Oz <laughs> and I started to find myself finding much more joy in that kind of release of feeling so nervous about who I was that I could just like be someone else for a moment so that's kind of how I got hooked to it and now it's just kind of like meditation almost where I'm like don't have to stress about myself anymore I get to stress about you uh yeah so that's kind of where I am and as well just to you know echo Sean I, I was very thankful to be in this and to learn all these new things and um find myself finding kind of like a little a little little corner in this very cool community of people who love comic books or study them or it's just really interesting so hi that's who i am so what welcome so what do you know what then what that mystery object you might put in there that's going to be evoking oh yeah what? so okay my mystery object yeah in my, in my splash page yeah i'm gonna say an inhaler I'm just really yeah, because, anxious because you could have put in a tree and not tell us about. Oh the, no, you're so uh, right. But that's okay. We'll take the inhaler. That's great. We'll put both. So Brian, welcome. Oh, hey everyone. Um, so I got my start in theater. Uh, I'm I'm originally from Virginia. And I got my start in theater, I think it was around middle school. And we would do like a couple of plays during the school year. Um, I think the one, at least the one that's more memorable for me was Princess and the Pea. I played Lester the Jester and I got to slip on a banana peel on stage, which was, everyone was scared, but I had a lot of fun. I will say that's the mystery object for me, banana peel right there um <laughs> gave it away, <laughs> uh, but um but yeah but i was doing theater and it just got me out of my shell i was very very shy very introverted person uh growing up in school and when i went out on stage that seemed to disappear so i just enjoyed engaging with those type of roles and 
I studied it in college and then moved up here to Chicago and I've been doing theater ever since. And um, coming into this play, th this was an enjoyable experience. I uh, knew about it through, um, uh, Mark and I have a mutual friend and she let me know about this audition that was happening for Innocence of the Dedu Seduction and read this and I read the play and, and really enjoyed it and just surprised that Matt Baker existed in this world. Like he was a um this well known comic book artist. And so wanted to be a part of that. So I auditioned hours <laughs> working with people and got to be part of it. And I'm glad I did. I really enjoyed the experience and researching this guide and, and also bringing my take to him. And it is one of the more memorable play experiences I've had. So that's great. Thank you all for, for sharing that. Um, Mark, if we can pivot back to you in the origin, because I, I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned Haju's book. Um, it's because if you take, if we focus on the end of the play, and actually the final moments, but not the final, final moment, but the final exchange with, with Janice and Matt, with Janice saying, you know, all I ever wanted to do was to tell stories. I never thought I would be terrified to do that. And they got Matt, I'm, I'm terrified to not to. Um, what's, of course, fascinating in the reality of this, and this is shared in Haju's book, is that um, this would, in essence, uh, silence Janice Ballou. After, after 11 years working in the comics, she left and never returned. An interview right. there when she was 81, she confirmed, I couldn't go back there. I was scared to death. Do you know what they did to us? Um, and it feels like that's now, now that you've shared that that influence of that book, um, it, it's fascinating that that's the beginning of your journey. Um, Matt Baker, um, of course, this is suggested in terms of how he's he's struggling in the play, but he passed away years, a few, a few years later, 1959, mm -hmm. at the age of 38, the heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you see Bill Gaines rising empowered in a stronger voice and we have mad magazine so we get that right. pivot that happens so can we go back to your journey and and so you pretty much knew you were going to focus on these three as as telling the story did that happen um, you know i i had always thought that that you know, that book was very it was super important i mean it, like from a long time from being a comic book fan for a long time i had actually seen the Gaines testimony uh video and I, I thought, God, this could be, you could just take this and sort of drop it into a, a dramatic sense and get something out of it. And I thought, this is really interesting. And so I started reading, and, but that book um, suggested to me that in a very real way to what you're saying, that um, my intent was you had this moment when those people bill gaines who were able to try to stand up and fight against this were the least equipped to do it effectively and the people who had no power to really stand up against it got crushed and um i think that that's sort of where i started building in uh the one thing about haji's book of course when you talk about matt baker is haji never goes into the the homosexuality that mm -hmm. I found elsewhere. And uh, that was a huge key. Like, I was like, well, here it is. This is the whole thing. Uh, there's a really great book called, and this may be going beyond your question, but I mean, there's a great book called uh, uh, God, Matt Baker. There's a book entirely about Matt Baker and the, the title escapes me. Uh, there it is. Yeah. The Art of Glamour. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that where it really goes into this, his homosexuality. And, you know, there were several times in that book, people were interviewed and they said, well, he had this relationship with Archer St. John and I don't know what it was. And I, and I was like, it was suggesting so many things to me because immediately after reading Hauser's book in attempting to link everything together, I was like, well, wouldn't it be interesting if Matt and Janice had a relationship and mm -hmm. then I read the Art of Glamour book, and I was like, whoa, this is even better. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I think that um, the trajectory, I mean, I, it's not, it's not, you can't deny the fact that here is the, the straight white male 
is able to pivot out of this situation and find a way out of it. And the, the, the woman and the man of color who's also gay are not able to pivot out of it. And I think that that's, uh, Haju started the suggestion of that. And then through further research, I developed even more of it. So I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. No, that's, that's fascinating. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's also interesting in terms of the structure and what you decided to now explore. And we'll go further like the use of the narrator and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but the hearings themselves, it's, it's, it's a very, fairly short moment, short sequence, because it's really more about that being like a, this ripple effect and how it's then, how it impacts everybody else in the industry, which I found very fascinating. So it really mm -hmm. isn't about the hearings, it's really more about the, 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 if you will, maybe the, the, the paranoia or the power uh, wanting to have some control of this social, this cultural um, media, uh, similar to what was happening with the Huac and the uh, uh, Red Channels and and right. the blacklisting is going on in film and television. Now we're hitting doing the delinquency in the comic books. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, I think I think that uh, you know the hearing is pivotal. I mean, that's why it's at the end of the first act. Um, mm -hmm because that's when that's when it goes from being trying to massage your way out of this situation to dealing with a i think i think it's irrefutable that that testimony made the whole situation worse mm -hmm. and um yes i know <laughs> um but uh it's uh, it, and i think to this day, I mean, like you read these interviews with the other publishers and they're just like how he, you know, he screwed us, you know, completely because he got up there and he thought he was going to, it had the best of intentions, best of intentions. But yeah, it is, uh, that is the, the point where it becomes almost, I guess, uh, triage, you know, trying to figure out how to fix this. So, right. Right. So let's, um, so, so Sean, we'll start with you. Um, what was, I mean, Brian, you've now shown one of your, one of your sources for, for, for exploring and researching your character. Uh, Sean, what kind of research were you doing in terms of preparation for the role when you knew you were going to take on the role? So, um, I started listening, uh, to the testimony. Um, and, uh, I have, you know, several books on EC, uh, put together by Fantagraphics. Uh, and then I tracked down a copy of uh, The Mad World of, of William M. Gaines by um, Frank Jacobs. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of reading of the EC reprints um, that I could get my hands on just to kind of get a feel for it all. Um, it was it was the best research I've ever had to do for a show, right? Um, uh, I, I learned a lot, but it was also stuff that I was already really interested in. So, um, it was a, a double bonus, uh, for me, uh, in that area. And Megan, how about you and your approach to the character and research and preparation? Yeah, um, there was, the cast in the show was so knowledgeable. It was, I walked in, I was like, oh my God, I need to up my game here uh because we were doing like comic book trivia at the beginning of rehearsal and there was a very large dramaturgical packet uh that you could spend hours on thank you mark and it was just i found myself really going into this thinking that this kind of subject matter would not be as interesting to me as like as anything else and throughout this whole process, I've started to like actually, I, I don't know, like keep up with this kind of thing. So when I was starting, I was reading the dramaturgical packet and I was just kind of listening to conversations and things. Uh, yeah, it, since then, I've started to actually care a lot more and listen to podcasts and be much more interested. So my prep work was to just be in the room and <laughs> listen to my peers. <laughs> that was about it. 
That's great. And then Brian, anything else that you add, you add in terms of your preparation for the role? Yeah. So yeah, like the book, The Art of Glamour was a very big help and a big resource in uh, learning about Bat Matt Baker because there's not a lot of first person interviews with him. You don't how he speaks. There's not known, you know, through his associates and uh, his family about who he was and how he grew up and his uh, journey with the comic, with comic books. Um, look, look at a couple of podcasts and a couple of views and learn that, but that was, the book was the big source and the dramaturge packet as well. You kind of get a sense of who Matt was and how he kind of went about uh, about the world. And then um, in terms of like, yeah, they mentioned about alleged that he, would, he was gay. That was coming from, that came from an interview from his friend, uh, Frank Gisto. Mm -hmm. um, he did an interview like talking about him expressing about that. And there was a moment where it just, I kind of decided I'd be like, he was hitting on him, which I was like, okay, sure. Um, and a couple of associates mentioned about that, that he had, you know, uh, so, some relationships like that. Um, but yeah, like learning about this, I was just surprised just knowing that that he's one of the, at least one of the, one of the first African-American comic book artists out there that helped to kind of help kind of, uh, I guess, bring bring this journey along, especially when he mentions the picture novel, which we now call a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of like one of the first to ever bring that. So just learning about him was just, it was just a joy and just such a surprise and just to get to delve into that history. That's great. Thank you. Um, um, Mark, the the production design, similar to Mark, Mark of Cain, of course, is very vibrant. Um, a lot of it's, you know, the striking, that four color, uh, influence, but also with your design or the design of this production um, is we have the television um, screen, which is fascinating. One, of course, it gives us then that focus on the art, gives us the focus on illustrations. It's giving us some of the you know, news um, uh, headlines, uh, illustrations, um, photos, and, and so on. But it's also providing that channel of broadcasting um, the televised hearing. Um, I'm curious, when did the television element that television screen part of the production when did that come into the story development for you well uh the in all of these all of these plays uh because i'm dealing with a visual art form mm -hmm. uh the projection element has always been part of it mm -hmm. um i feel like that has to be there we have to see the actual artwork we have to see these things um our brilliant uh projection lighting and set designer g max maxim the fourth mm -hmm. um he came up with this idea of the television and uh that lent itself to the idea of doing the live video of sean doing the testimony mm -hmm. um that the one the other thing that it lent itself to that i don't believe is in the video was actually our our intermission was an actual news report of the time period about the, the it was the the uh, uh confidential file uh i cut i cut that down to like a 10 minute video and we played that over the intermission so uh yeah it, it that was entirely the television a aspect was entirely max's idea uh the mm -hmm. projections were always there but mm -hmm. he was the one who brought that in and then i immediately was like oh and then we can do this and then we can do that we can do this you know so yeah, it's a really powerful, powerful use of that. And then uh, I'm glad you clarified what happened in the intermission. I was going to ask you about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, so so actors then the acting very stylized, which fits in terms of the writing. It fits in terms of this idea. We've got this living comic book, if you will. Um, it's also in, in essence through the prism of the narrator. Um, you could interpret that too. But um, how what was that process for you as an actor in the creation? Now we creation of the character, their inner life, their physical presence, and then the entrance and embodiment of that in um, Mark's work. How was that process? I'll go. Sure, go ahead, Megan, thanks. Uh, yeah, it was, at first, I was challenged uh, by it. 
because it, it is a little stylized and for both mine and Brian's characters, they have such a huge impact in the emotional elements of the show and have probably some of the least amount of stage time when it comes to like having those moments. So that was something that was, you know, I had to navigate. Um, but otherwise, like it was really rewarding in finding, finally like finding like how big you had to be or when to pull it back or how to get things across in a way that was still honest, but also very carried the weight of what these situations were. Uh, so my, my own process was talking a lot with Mark and really kind of honing in on who our Janice was and who we wanted her to be for the show and what kind of her role in the overarching story was not just who she is as a person but how she can kind of manipulate the emotional aspect of this show uh yeah that's great uh, thank you yeah, thank you. um yeah the, the yeah the style of the show like it the tone of it just varies you go from comedic dramatic comedic it's like you you're in a comic book story like that's usually the tone and so that was kind of that's fun to play with but like what megan was saying when dealing with um like the dramatic story but yeah in the style this stylized world was it was very interesting but at the same time kind of you had to just commit to this world and stay within it and you know this was for me like i had to kind of stay true to who this person was you know, in under these circumstances. So, um, but it was it was quite a challenge, and definitely one of the biggest ones was the coming out scene. Uh, mm -hmm. During that one was just it, it was just ginormous for me, and it was very hard <laughs> and very emotional to try to get to that place. But that's something like. He had to bring to it because that's the arc of his story, him trying to come to terms with himself, you know, uh, dealing with his identity at the same time, dealing with his decline of his career. So it's just for me, I just had to kind of just jump in and just see what happens. And it was quite an enjoyable experience and challenge for me. Wow. No, thank you, Sean. For me, uh, you know, obviously the EC sections uh, Mark and I talked about often were very much of screwball comedy uh, influence. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had that stylization, but also, you know, I definitely wanted to do justice to Bill Gaines, um, but not an impression. Uh, and so finding where Bill and I, you know, where his, where I could tell his story and I felt his story and could understand him. Um, that was a very uh, great experience. Uh, and I think uh, helped me a lot uh, with that. Uh, I will also say that probably more than more than Megan or Brian, uh, our great uh, costumer, Beth Lasky Muller, that costume for Bill Gaines, uh, you know, I, those pants uh, <laughs> were just, I mean, you put on those glasses and those big baggy pants and and it was on. So uh, that that very much helped me uh, in in that regard. Yeah, the so. pens were my favorite part of your costume. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the 45 pens in your pocket. <laughs> Mark, can you talk about how you uh, explore the use of the narrator? Well, okay. Uh, there was, I knew I was doing a show about EC comics, at least in the main. And, you know, the, the standard trope of every EC comic was that they had a host, uh, a one of the ghoulies that, you know, whether it was the Crypt Keeper or the Old Witch or the, the, uh, the, uh, what's the other one? Uh, whatever. There's three of them. Um, and uh, as I was sitting there and I was like, well, I have to put Wortham in this show somehow. 
and and one day I was I was working on the show and I was like I was writing this whole scene where Wortham was giving a you know a, one of his ridiculous diatribes about about kids and I thought you know I'm just gonna make him the crypt keeper <laughs> and um it was possibly the greatest moment in the development of this script that I could ever ask for um, because I was just like, this makes so much sense. And it allowed me to, to not make, you know, I, I can't, this may be generous to say that Wortham isn't one note, but I mean, when you can have him pull out a bloody ax or, or, you know, have a dead rat that he's holding, you know, it, it, it allows you to not just be, this sort of diatribe guy uh, rattling off pseudoscientific nonsense, you know? And uh, yeah, it, it, it became one of the most fun things and it became where I could sort of bring the EC comics uh, style into the show without, because I didn't want to adapt any of the, I didn't want to adapt the stories. I didn't want to do any of that sort of thing for copyright issues as well as I just didn't think that served what I was trying to do. And so, but I wanted to bring that style in somewhere. So, uh, it was through, it was through Wortham and through the go, the ghost of, uh, Max Gaines, of course, uh, yeah. that I was able to bring that sort of thing in. It's genius. It's really, really, really marvelous. Well, I love that. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> the, um, we have playwrights here. Um, and so for context, many of the play playwrights, um, are also emerging screen and television writers. And so for some of them, the stage is this new form of expression for them, for their creative. And so I'd like for each one of you, um, if you can share with us is choose from your perspective, one scene or one moment in your performance, um, in this production that you know needs to be, it validates that this is a stage moment before a live audience in a production space. What might that moment be? Um, I can, I can, I can start myself. Yep. Um, and it, it was something that came late, but it was part of the design was, I think that the, the, the Senate hearing scene, uh, the way it ended up being staged, uh, made, made all the difference. And I thought, again, it's sort of like, I mean, we talked about Mark of Cain last year and the, the Bill Finger death scene. I don't know if any of the people who are watching saw that last year, but, uh, that was a very, that ended up being a very theatrical sort of moment. And I felt like, uh, the, the Senate hearings began to lend themselves to that as well. Uh, and because having the screen behind him as he was testifying, uh, you would never get that in, in a film. It would just be cutting back and forth and, and you don't get that, that image. So that's mine. Thank you. I, I will I, let you know this is the hardest question. <laughs> it is. This is the hardest question. <laughs> um, for me, I, I think it it comes the moment uh, when Bill decides to uh, shut down EC when uh, or to to shut down the, the horror titles. And I'm giving the speech, uh, which was written in an EC comic. And my father uh, lays his hand on my on my shoulder and gives me the comic book to rip up. And I'm ripping up a real comic book, um, not an EC comic book. It's a fake cover. But um, that, to me, I would cry some nights uh, because it, it that felt like a real moment of just everything that Bill had in his soul was being torn to shreds. And that felt like a real moment of theater for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think uh, for me, something that really is different is how you can stage people so far away from each other. 
um, like for example, for Janice in the first few scenes, just the way it was staged, she was kind of far away from her scene counterpart. They were on opposite ends of the stage. And as she got more confident in her abilities and closer to these people, she was on the same little platform with them. And then as soon as she loses her position, loses her job, she's now far away from the people she's doing scenes with again. And me personally, that really helps in the way that I interpret these scenes and how I inform the way that I like feel comfortable on the stage. Like my, my my true example is the scene where her dad kind of like auctions her off to uh, someone trying to get her a, a regular job, a safe, a woman's job. And the way that I think it was so devastating that not only did she feel betrayed by her dad, but they were on opposite ends of the stage. So there was no closeness there emotionally or physically. And I think in on screen, that element, that physical uh, kind of removal from each other is hard to mm -hmm. establish, especially if you're just on each other's faces. So I think that's something unique in theater is you can play with like where you are in your world, not only, you know, what you do in it. That's great. Thank you. Um. Oh, this is tough. Um, there's, yeah, a lot of theatrical moments, but I think for me, in terms that it seems like I kind of get a sense of how this is going to wrap up. Like, I don't know if you notice my hand on my heart each time during the scenes. It kind of gives it, for me, that moment is just, it's very intimate. And it just kind of gives a sense of him just kind of fighting with himself and what he's feeling. And when those moments, those emotional moments happen, it's like, oh, he's having, he's kind of having this kind of this mini heart attack. He doesn't know what to do because he doesn't really express those feelings. So I just, I just found it so, uh, it was just, just so beautiful with just being just like hand on the heart and just be like, okay, this is where I am, and now these moments are coming. So I, those are usually, those are usually my, that, my favorite device in there. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing this. We've got one more question for each, each of you. Um, what is a secret that you know about your character? Something about their life that you wish to share with our audience? In other words, it wasn't revealed in the work, but you might know something that you would like to share with us about that character. Pass. <laughs> Come on, Mark, tell us a secret about yourself. <laughs> um, I think for me, I don't know if it's a secret. Um, and I don't really know if it's about the character, but it's about Janice. Yeah. Um, throughout the run of the show, uh I, I forget which show it was, but personally I felt so like this was so in the past. I was like, oh, this this is like history. But I got a Facebook message from Janice, uh, Janice's son out of nowhere. And he was just like, hi, I heard you're playing my mom in a play. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, And that just made it so like, so real. And so, I, I don't know. It was just, it was, it was so cool. We had a little chat. Uh, I invited him to the show. He did not come, but it was just such a cool moment where everything felt so real and so personal and so much more grounded. And I was like, I felt so much more pressure. To, <laughs> like, oh no, <laughs> her son knows that I'm doing this. Uh, so that's my little secret is that this isn't as far away as we thought. And, you know, real people and real lives were involved. And I got to talk to her son. So <laughs> that's my yeah. secret. That's special. Thank you. Yeah. I would say uh, for Bill, uh, for all his strangeness, uh, I think that the the experience he went through in the 50s really informed the rest of his life and made him really cherish Mad Magazine and his staff. 
and he had a very patriarchal style with that staff. Um, he took care of people, but not too much, right? Um, he, you know, Dick DeBartolo asked for a raise one time. He said, let's go to dinner and talk about it. During dinner, they talked more than they, they spent more money on that dinner and the drinks than he would have given him in the raise. And he then turned him down for the raise. And DePartolo mentioned that. And he said, yeah, I, I like I like drinking and good conversation. I, I don't like giving people raises. But uh, he did, in his own way, he really cared about his artists and writers. Mm -hmm. And he kept until Mad shut down, like 92 or so, close to when he died. He kept every page of EC art in a vault. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'm trying to think of a secret. I think it's a secret, but one thing I uh, that was inter interesting to learn about him is that I know in the in the play you see he lives by himself. He's single bachelor, but he actually during the time he was doing comic books, he lived with his brother, who was also a comic book artist. Um, mm -hmm. which was real, which I thought that was really interesting is that his all his brother also was in the industry. He kind of drew for a bit, but wasn't as um, wasn't as recognized or as well known as Matt was, you know, for his work. Mm -hmm. So um, that that was a really interesting detail that he would um, that at times he would collaborate with his brother with uh, with drawings. So who's going to tell this what's going on in the chat here? <laughs> Let's rock, paper, scissors. I can tell it. Um, a little secret about Janice uh, that I just remembered that is actually about the character is that the page that Reed Crandall gives her, she's like, oh my God, thank you. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, she kept and hung on her wall for till, when was that? When went till she died? Is that true? Yeah, till she died. So it meant so much to her and it was genuinely a huge gesture for her. So that's my real secret <laughs> These yeah, are uh, yeah yeah infamously uh you know, not infamously but uh, in in haji's book when he interviews her she has that page on her wall framed in her home in florida at the age of uh 70 80 whatever she was at that time yeah yeah fascinating so um can you uh, mark can you give us a little bit of a preview of what's happening now in the third installment of this trilogy well, uh, I just uh, turned in my production draft, uh, and it is called The House of Ideas, and it is, for those comic book fans who may be there, may recognize that as being one of the famous phrases that Stan Lee used to uh, promote the Marvel comics in the 1960s. Uh, it is about Stan and Jack, which mm -hmm. is a very, very fraught uh, conversation for a lot of people um, and for me uh, that is a story of uh, in my opinion two men who did their best work together and then spent 30 years trying to claim that the other one didn't really have much to do with it and uh, I think that that is extraordinarily interesting in terms of talking about ego and uh, uh, ego, really, that's the word, and also extraordinarily sad. Uh, and uh, I, I'm Terry McCabe will be directing that one. He directed The Mark of Cain and uh, is, at least for now, the artistic director of City Lit Theater. This is this last season, and then he's doing this, uh, the next show as a guest artist. And uh, he is extremely excited because he says that uh, the Fantastic Four was his childhood. And uh, he has uh, offered to, he has, from when he was a kid, he has his, uh, I'm, I belong to the Mary Marvel Marching Society button that's about three inches wide that he, he's already said is going to be on stage somewhere on someone's costume. Uh, and then I looked that up on eBay and it's worth about $1,500. So I'm going to try to tell him not to do that. <laughs> so very good. Well, thank you very much. I don't know. Are there any questions that I haven't 
and I did cover the one that we did have written for you. I do want to share with you, though, another comment that they did say they wanted to share. They said, also, I thoroughly enjoyed the play. Thank you for it, which is shared by all of us. Thank you very much for this time, for sharing your thoughts, your creativity. Um, love this discussion. Thank you. Thank you.